It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is The Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Daniel Wilcox. Hello and welcome to the Great Writer Share podcast with me, Daniel Wilcox, where every week I hijack an hour or so of time from some of the kindest and hardest working writers around today to join me on the show and discuss everything that makes them tick, raw and bounce. Today's date is the 11th of February. It is a, it's a Wednesday already. I mentioned last week that the year is flying by. We in England have just survived um, Storm Kiara, or as I prefer to call her, Storm Kiara, given the, the strange spelling. Um, Forgive me if there are any Kiras out there that spell their name. I think it was C-I-A-R-A. Um, and we had, we've had we had all the weathers over the past couple of days. There's been winds, there's been gales, there's been rain, there's been snow. Um, and England's not the most exciting of weather climates, but, you know, it, it, it is what it is. And for people who normally just sit in miserable, muggy weather half the time, it was quite exciting. Places flooded. Not here. We got quite lucky here. Um, but also, we didn't catch the snow that half the people caught, so... No snow days for me, unfortunately, but there you go. Um, in my personal update, I'll jump straight into I've got a couple of things that have happened over the past week. So uh, my website has launched. I've done all the final tweaks. It is beautiful. Anyone who um, heard me shout out last week that it was nearly done, it is up. It is finished. And I have started blogging. So um, I've got a lot of posts on there. or I'm building a library of posts on there of just a mix of things. I think I mentioned last week. It's not a uh, it's not a vehicle to try and just get to lots of people for me. It's more of a cathartic thing. Um, I'm posting sort of weekly updates, keeping myself accountable. I've got a couple of stories on there. Um, just using it to to vent, communicate, just say some of the things I think. Um, and if you're interested in that kind of thing, then hop on over. Uh, there's also a really nice landing page for the Great Writer Share podcast. So if you go over to www.danielwilcox.com forward slash Great Writer Share, there'll be a page there with info on all this, um, including previous guests. There's a form on there if you are an author listening and fancy coming on the show and feel like just reaching out um, and having your voice heard, then by all means, come on. We, well, I, I'd like everyone from bestsellers to just starting out to everything in between as this is all about Writers from every level of the business getting involved and sharing their opinions and their strategies. Uh, I've also had a, a story published on the Other Stories podcast, which um, is quite a big deal for me because the Other Stories podcast is uh, something that I co-founded along with my brothers over at Hawk and Cleaver. Um, it's been running since 2016. We, we've we surpassed 5 million downloads a couple of weeks ago. Um, so it's a, it's a show that's doing absolutely well. And I stopped submitting stories while I was working on a few projects but realise how much I miss just writing these short 2,000 word story form. Um, it's something that, it's always been a cathartic experience, it's always been something for the art, it's always been something I've loved doing, but I have put it aside while, you know, obviously there are reasons that I put this show on hiatus, the, I was working on other novels with different people. Um, it was nice to go back to there and be back on the podcast as well. And uh, I know some of the people might out there might be thinking, well sure you're going to get stories on the podcast because you work for them, but we we have four stories every theme and we run a different theme every four weeks and I always make a point of putting my story in the hands of other people to judge and not automatically put myself on there because the same with this I think it's 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 fair to give other people a platform and I don't want to ever feel like I automatically get it right just because I've written a story I want it to be credit worthy and good enough to um to to make the pile and in this case obviously it was it's a story that i'm very excited about uh, it was on the theme of silence and it's about a, a boy made mute by some supernatural stuff that happened with his family so if you want to check that one out just go over to the other stories podcast check it out it's about 15 20 minutes long beautifully narrated by um one of our fellow actors over there and writers josh curran so definitely worth a a listen another shout out i want to put out is uh, me and some of the Hawk and Cleaver guys are visiting StokerCon in Scarborough this year. So if anyone is visiting Scarborough around the time of StokerCon, which um, I believe is sort of the end of March, beginning of April, um, and wants to say hi or anyone going to StokerCon, feel free to reach out. We want to say hi to as many people as we can. Say, you know, just just get on board, network, just meet new people. So yeah, reach out, say hi. And 
we'll hopefully see you there. If you're not going, uh, it's probably worth going, particularly if you're a horror writer. It's, it's the... I don't want to say the biggest horror writers convention, but it's run by the Horror Writers Association. It's the first time it's come to the UK, so I'm very excited to head there and meet people. Um, I believe people like Adam Neville, Paul Tremblay, and I believe even Joanna Penn is going to make a visit. So uh, it'd be nice to catch up and say hi. Um, and then my final little bit of an update from me is that I have now officially started a Facebook group for The Great Writer Share. So for people who want to get involved, want to drop comments, want to answer questions, want to try and put their questions forward for people uh, on the show then head on over to facebook.com slash groups slash great writers share or just search for great writers share in the search bar uh, and get involved. I really am keen to build a community of writers that are all sharing, all getting involved. Um, it's a it's a platform where you can literally just have your opinion heard. I want to shout you out. I want to I want to get you guys noticed. And for the people who are already patrons to the show, uh, this won't affect you guys in any way. You'll still get a load of your benefits that you still get hold of. You'll still get early access to the show. You'll still get priority in asking the guests any questions. Um, but I'm going to have a bit of a reshuffle and look at better ways to bring value to those on Patreon and for those who just want to get involved in the community and make more of that Facebook group. So head on over www.facebook.com slash groups slash great writers share. Uh, there, sh- there will be a link in the show notes as well. On the topic of Patreon, we have no new patrons this week, but as always, feel free to go over to patreon.com forward slash great writers share. The guys that pledge their support for the show are the people that keep this show running. Um, Obviously, as a podcaster, this is a free endeavor for myself. I would do all the work myself. And by just putting forward a dollar a month, which is less than the cost of a coffee, you're really helping keep the lights on and keep the show going. Um, and helping bring value to you guys and uh, I am loving having the chance to interview such amazing guests and like I say I've got some wicked people lined up so definitely jump on Patreon for the advance notice on all of that stuff. But today's guest is uh, a very very interesting guest, it's someone I've been trying to organise him coming on the show for a while, calendars didn't meet and then different things cropped up but we finally got there and I'm very excited to say that Craig or Craig A. Falconer, we're British, Craig A. Falconer is uh, this week's guest, and we go into a whole load of stuff on the show. He's um, he's he's someone that's fascinated me since I first met him in Edinburgh, which was July last year. And uh, he he's one of these really quiet, successful guys who you wouldn't know by looking at him that he's doing such amazing things. Um, he's a sci-fi writer. He's got several series out that are absolutely killing it. He's running incredible deals with people like Audible. He's killing it on KU. Um, and in this interview, we go a lot into how he managed to make that success. Um, talks a lot about modeling specific success, which I'll let him explain what that means. We talk about his recent endeavor into box sets and how he's working that system and providing extra value and using box sets as an additional product to leverage what he's already got. And we go very much into details on how he managed to write 113,000 words in 13 days to hit a deadline. Um, again, I'll. I'll leave that one for Craig to explain because there's a lot in that story, but it is incredibly interesting. For someone who straight up said to me a few months ago is someone who writes very slow and it took him several years to write a book that was 220,000 words to smash out that kind of word count in 13 days is interesting to say the least. So uh, yeah, listen ahead and he'll explain about how that happened, how that looked. And particularly the bit that I found interesting is how that affected the quality of his writing. One thing I do also want to know is that there was a technical glitch about halfway through this interview, so I've tried to stitch it together as best as I possibly can, but there is one tiny section that sounds like it doesn't flow, um, but you're really not missing anything out apart from sort of like a couple of words either side, so forgive that. It's uh, it's a part of the process, and, and sometimes it happens, but there we go. But without any further ado, I will get out of your way so that we can get on with the interview with the one and the only Craig A. Falconer. Craig A. Falconer is a best-selling Scottish novelist specialising in science fiction. He has written several widely popular series in his career, including the Not Alone series, Teradox series, and the Sycamore series. Craig, welcome to the show. Hey, Dan. Thanks for having me. No, it's, uh, it's good, good to have you. It's been a, been a while since we caught up. I think um, we first encountered each other, like quite a few of my guests, at the Edinburgh Conference last year, the 20 Books to 50K Edinburgh Conference. Um, and I guess my first question that I wanted to dive into is, uh, have you recovered from winning the Cayley in Edinburgh? Yeah, I have. Um, I still feel like Rami gave me that award, ironically, after my <laughs> dancing the night before. But it's it's been long enough now. It took a few months for me to recover, but we're there. Mm. 
Yeah, for people know. who are obviously aren't in the know, the we we did a Kaylee on the Saturday night, I think it was, where everyone got involved. It was, yeah. Did some dancing. Yeah. And uh, what was the was the award was for best dress or best dancer or well it was supposed to be for best dancer, but Rami changed it to best dress so that he could give it to me with <laughs> yes. some plausible deniability, you know. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. And I know that um, I remember one of the things that I was speaking to you about in uh, Edinburgh is obviously you had a lot of books in your backlist. And one of the big takeaways you were talking about was the fact that you were going to start looking at things like box sets and things like audio books. Has yeah. that happened over the last few months? And how is that going? Yeah, well, it has. Well, both of those aspects have gone really well in the last few months. The audio was already in play. I've been doing really well with audio for the last three or four years, but Edinburgh is really what spurred me on to do the box sets. Talking to Rami that week and Brandon especially, they convinced me to do some box sets. And this month, now January is my best ever month, beating December, which was my best ever month. And those are purely really based on the box sets. I've had three box sets since Edinburgh. And those have just been insane. The page reads revenue that you get from the box sets. And I took some really specific points from Brandon, some general points from Rami about how you promote a box set differently from what you would do with a normal launch. And then a lot of the same things apply. And then one of the best parts I've done recently is I leveraged the Not Alone box set. One, two, and three came out two weeks before Not Alone four. So then I had really good sell through to the fourth book at full price, which has been great. But yeah, the, the box sets, that's been the largest point of my acceleration recently in terms of the work I've been doing because people who know me know that it, it might look like I've got quite a few books. There's maybe like 11 books, but that's over a span of like six years. Like I, I don't produce heavily. So there's been these kind of blank spaces in my calendar over time. I've gone months. Sometimes I've gone a year, two years without release. But recently the box sets have helped to plug that gap between the third Not Alone book, the fourth Not Alone book. So it's a huge benefit when you can leverage your backlist like that, because a backlist is a great thing when you have the individual books, but when you have them in box sets, you can direct people to something that's an easy sell when they're getting three or four books for one good price. So really Edinburgh was massive for me. I've been to a few of these conferences now. I mean, we first met, almost met in London when we were there, but we didn't yes. actually meet. <laughs> and then I went to Vegas that year. And from every one of the conferences, you get something. But from Edinburgh, that I mean, that's changed my career just by forcing me into the box sets. Mm. Because the revenue is a game changer, really. Yeah. And what was the sort of specifics in mindset change that made you start looking more seriously at the box sets? What were the things that, if you're happy to share, um, Rami Vance yeah, and definitely. Brandon Sanderson shared with you? Well, the mindset change that made me want to do it was, to be honest, well, this is a solitary pursuit, right? We spend so long working on our own. And I've been doing well with the Not Alone series for years. And my goal was always kind of, I mean, quite seriously, I was sort of thinking like, what's the least work I can do to continue to make this kind of money? But I was saying that quite seriously because I don't want to work, you know, 16 hours a day every day. Like some people are just driven to work, work, work. Where for me, it was, I enjoy the work. This is the best work I could possibly do. But sometimes it's work and it feels like a means to an end. But then in Edinburgh, when I saw how hard some people work at it and especially there was a time management panel that Katie Forrest was on it and Liz Kelly and I think the third one was Martha that was on that and just th this realization that some people are squeezing every hour that they possibly can to max everything out when I've kind of been doing the opposite for so long just trying to make as much money as I can in the least amount of hours that I can I started to think not for the rest of my life but maybe for six months for a year what if I just you know, pedal to the metal, work as hard as I can, how much can I achieve? And with the box sets, to be honest, that's not even that much work because the books are written. Mm. For the Sycamore series, I had to thoroughly rewrite book one because it was seven years old at that point, six years old at that point. And I've obviously matured a lot. But really, it was this time management and kind of the context that that provided. And that's what forced me into it. And then the specifics that came from Rami and Brandon were more in terms of the presentation and how to advertise at Rami taught me all about bookbub ads there and one thing I really got from Rami was that it's more important to specialize in one form of ads rather than kind of try and be a jack of all trades and be quite good at Facebook quite good at bookbub that was his big thing that he told me then he said just pick one and I think he put this in a good post that he done in the 20 books Facebook group and he said just pick one ad outlet and get good at it 
And for the box sets, really, I'd, I haven't done any Facebook ads. I've done minimal Amazon ads. It's just been BookBub ads on the launch. And that was huge, just spending my time there because we only have so many hours to spend mm. on ads, right, when we're writing. So you have to make sure they work for you. And if you can get good at Facebook, then get good at Facebook. If you try Facebook and it's, it seems too difficult, try something else. Amazon ads these days have gotten so expensive, so I haven't really put much time and money there. But Rami taught me about BookBub. Brandon helped me with the title and, and the covers. And a big thing for me was I was modeling specific success. I wasn't just looking at box sets, what works for a box set. I was looking at specific box sets that had done well on sci-fi. And that was Brandon. That was Nathan Heistad. And I took some things from them, some pretty specific things like to have a 2D cover rather than the three-dimensional standard box set cover that you would see in fantasy or other sci-fi. But sci-fi box sets that had done really well in the past six months to a year some of the key ones had had 2D covers, so I went for that. That's quite then, interesting. I've never, I, w- I wouldn't have considered that yeah. to be the biggest sell. Why do you think that is? I've no idea. <laughs> I've absolutely no idea because the whole psychology point of the 3D cover is it instantly conveys that it's a box set, it instantly conveys value that you're getting three books. But when I looked at the revenue these guys had been making, which you know they openly share with me, and then I look at the number of box sets there are. There are a lot of box sets, but not that many of them do well. And in sci-fi, the ones that stuck recently had had 2D covers, so that's what I went for. And then I was talking to some of these guys about the covers, and one thing that came to mind was it's not ideal to use a cover that's too similar to the existing cover, to your book one cover, because from one standpoint, that's good branding. People know that it's yours. But on the other standpoint, particularly with something like Not Alone, when it came to that, that book sold so many copies over so many years. People have seen it. You know, everyone who looks at sci-fi and Amazon has seen it. So either they've bought it and read it or they've decided not to buy it. So you don't want to keep showing them the same cover. If you can rotate, I've never rotated the cover, but when you change the cover up for a box set, it is essentially rotating the cover. You're presenting a new product. Whereas if I just launch again with a 3D cover with the familiar not alone on the front, people think, oh, I've seen it, I've read it, mm-hmm. or I've not read it. And an important thing with Not Alone was there was two and a half years between book one and book two, right? So obviously, book two done really well, but obviously I lost a lot of readers over that time frame. And then I managed to get a lot of them back with the box set. But if the box set had just been the familiar cover on the front, they might think I've read that book because they've seen the cover. So it was all these little things I got from talking to guys whose box sets I was specifically modeling. Rather than just looking at the general landscape of sci-fi box sets, there were a few that I wanted to replicate. And I just did everything I could to do that. And then Rami's stuff, his wasn't as applicable in terms of presentation because it's urban fantasy, which is a completely different crowd. But in terms of marketing and stuff like that, it was invaluable. So I thank him all the time for that because his tips on BookBub and stuff like that were huge. So it's just taking, taking marketing tips from wherever you can get them. But I think one thing that people don't do enough of is model specific success. Because you can't just say, well, successful authors are doing these things. I should do these things. You need to look at specific books and specific authors and say, why did this book succeed? If that's the book you want to replicate, you have to look carefully at it and then do as many of those things as you can, which is what I tried to do with the box sets because of Edinburgh, really, because of the wisdom that I got there. Not just the wisdom, but the, you know, like kick up the arse, you know, like work <laughs> harder, that kind of thing. When you spend yeah. time with people like Craig Martell, you know, you get the work ethic it rubs off on you. Mm, yeah, there's <laughs> something feel. there's something uh for want of a better word, enchanting, something contagious about being in a room surrounded by lots of people doing what you're doing. Cause like you say, it Absolutely. is a, a yeah. solitary pursuit most of the time. Very um much. so how did your day in terms of how your day looked before Edinburgh and after Edinburgh, what were the sort of key changes that you made in your work schedule to increase that productivity? Well, I mean, quite honestly, before the two months before Edinburgh, I hadn't really done anything at all. I was maybe working like <laughs> two hours a day. Just keep it because Not Alone Three had came out in May. It came out in May 2019, and I'd been working really hard on that for the last four or five months, and I was exhausted with it. I'd been doing heavy, heavy hours plotting it, writing it, launching it. So then, when July came around, between June and July, I had just been recuperating basically, but still doing the maybe two, three hours a day on ads because for that book, I was doing everything. I was trying to do Facebook, Amazon, BookBub, 
keeping the um, promo sites going and stuff like that, like the bargain books, there's a few of those that still move the needle enough to be worthwhile. I was trying to rotate them because I had the three books and had all three books at 99 cents. So I was rotating which one I was advertising, trying to optimize that schedule. But yeah, that was just a couple of hours. Then after Edinburgh, I really got serious and just started working hard on, initially it was rewriting Sycamore. And my day then was, it was just like a regular work day. I'd be working, not nine to five, probably more like 12 till eight would typically be my hours. And then I'd maybe have a few hours in between. So I'd maybe work solidly for six hours, but those would be six serious hours because I'd taken on a lot of the time management wisdom from Edinburgh. And I was blocking my time off far more deliberately. So I wasn't thinking I'll go and work for 10 hours, but in reality, focus for five of them. Yeah, I was going for eight hours and I was working for eight hours. I would say I'll do two hours on this and then I'll take a break. I'll do two hours on this. And the change in productivity when I was behaving like that, it was just incredible. I was thinking, why didn't I do this forever? The time blocks for me, it's like a writing sprint, but I wasn't writing because it wasn't composition. I was editing the old book, getting it in shape. But I was putting the same discipline in place as if I was writing sprints. And sprints before then had never really worked for me. You know, just saying, I'm going to write for this hour. I'm going to write for these two hours because it always felt too constricting. Mm. But it worked out really well because the habits that I learned during the rewrite of Sycamore 1 and the time discipline that I learned since then, I have applied to writing for composition of new words. So now I can say I've got two hours here. I'll write 3,000 words. And I can do that now, which is the only way I've been able to accelerate and the other aspect of word production, which I've done since the box sets were completed. So now in my days, my days now I'm trying to get back to normal because for the last couple of weeks, it's just been ridiculous <laughs> in the deadline. I think we'll talk about that later, but you know, like, I mean, literally 19 hour days for consecutively five or six days in a row. Let's dive into that now. I, I do think now will be a good time yeah. to dive into that. So you uh, wrote 113,000 words in, was it 11 days? It was uh, 27, 29, yeah. It was, there were 13 total days, but mm. three of the days I didn't really write anything. Yeah. So it was so really you, like 10 days. Yeah. You write quite long books as part of obviously um, your yeah. brand as an author. Um, how did you find yourself in the predicament where that had to be the case? And how then did you actually get your head down and make sure that those words came out? Because that is, that is a, a healthy chunk of words to write in such a short amount of time. It is. I mean, and for context, especially for me, because the first not alone took a, a year to write. And the second one, I think it took about four months. And if I was getting 3000 words in a day, that was a big day. It was a big day. And I would feel like taking the next day off. I'd be thinking, wow, I got 3000 words yesterday. <laughs> so it was huge. But then after Edinburgh, the two things that I decided to accelerate were the box sets. And then I decided to do three books in the Not Alone series and the time it would normally take me to write one because I wanted an audio deal for all three at once, which we can get into later as well. But that's what necessitated the general need for acceleration of production. And it was never supposed to be quite like that, the speed that I needed for Not Alone 5. But before that, I had Not Alone 4, which I had to finish before 20 Books Vegas. I think I had like two months to write that, which for me was really tight. And that felt like my four minute mile when I managed to plot the book and then write the book within those two months. So then when I was confronted with this, okay, now you've got two weeks to write Not Alone 5, <laughs> it felt almost impossible, but it didn't feel literally impossible, which it would have felt a couple of months earlier because basically I needed 10,000 words a day, but I had done 10,000 words a day, sometimes two and three days in a row during the last book. I just hadn't done it like 13 days in a row, you know? <laughs> And then it really was just a case of necessity. There's, there's no avoiding it. I just had to write the words. So there was no tiredness or anything. And really, it became almost frightening, like how much momentum just kicked in. And I'd look, I mean, literally, I don't want to oversell it and say it was like an out-of-body experience or anything, but sometimes I would look at the clock and it would be like two hours later than it was last time. And the word count would be like 3,000 words higher. And I look back and the words were clean. That's the strangest thing. Like the book was cleaner than anything I've written. I think speed, once you've, I mean, once you know how to write, especially within your own world and you know the characters, 
speed helps. I mean, I used to not believe that. I used years ago, I would have been one of the people who thought if you're writing 10,000 words a day, they're going to be shit. You know, like, <laughs> how can you write 10,000 words a day? That would take me a week. But especially when you know where the story's going and stuff like that, you know the characters. Speed helps. Speed's a benefit. And obviously, I don't want to ever be in a situation again where I need a need to write 10,000 words every day for like however many days in a row because it gets difficult. And we mentioned this just at the start before we started recording. There was one day when I wrote like 14 and a half thousand words, which for me, that might as well be a million. Like that was mm. so far beyond my comprehension a couple of months ago. But now I can do it. And those are some of my favorite chapters in that book. And the book's back from beta readers now because I had to submit it to Audible on Sunday. And it was people's favorite one yet. That's and incredible. As incredible as the word. But mm. it, I mean, if my four-minute mile was the last one, this felt like it was flying. And it was <laughs> the one-minute one. mile. But along the way, I've read like Chris Fox's 5,000 words an hour. I've read all these books, so I knew all the theories of how to write quickly and to block your time and get into the flow zone and stuff like that. But I'd never really applied it just purely because I'd never really had to apply it because it's a difficult thing to do. And for the first time ever, it actually became tiring. Like my, my hands were tired when you're writing that many words, just through sheer force of typing. It actually became the point that like my legs were sore from sitting still, my hands were tired. And that was happening before the mental exhaustion was kicking in. Mm. Because my, my brain was just on autopilot <laughs> at that point. <laughs> yeah. I do think momentum is one of the the biggest things you can build up and particularly for a lot of people because um I mean I don't I, I write a fair chunk of words a day. I don't I don't hit sort of the 10, 14s as often as I kind of want to. But mm -hmm. for all the people that do spend a lot of time saying, oh, the people that write that amount of words a day can't be writing anything good. I do think there's an element of that in which you want to reply and just say, well, have you tried it? Because exactly. yeah. I think it's, it's easy once you've experienced it because, I mean, you could have gone through that, looked back and gone, actually, these words were utter shit. You know, it didn't, nothing came out <laughs> yeah. like it should have. Um, but you're not saying that. You're saying that your readers came back and they loved it. Um, obviously you didn't want to be in a position where that was the case and you had to get to that point but I guess in a way for you it must have been some it was a learning experience to know what you're capable of and I know that Absolutely. for me when I hit new sort of personal best it does make me look back on what I do daily and go huh maybe I could you know increase that more and kind of um up my game a bit have you found that still since you finished yeah definitely I mean like we're both saying you never want to be in a position where you have to do that mm. but if I'm writing 14,000 words and a 19 hour day, which includes some editing as I go, some plotting and stuff like that. I feel like if I could just apply that same feeling of urgency without the actual urgency, if you can sort of trick your mind and hitting this kind of productivity, if I do that for 10 hours, I could be hitting, you know, six, 7,000 words consistently, which soon adds up even five days a week, 35,000 words a week. I could be writing one of these books every month, 120,000 words without killing myself doing it every two weeks there is a middle ground between that and once every year you know mm -hmm. i just need to to find that middle ground <laughs> was there any point along the way where you thought you weren't going to make it and you seriously you yeah. know, put your head down and went yeah this isn't going to yeah. happen on um january the 2nd the morning of january the 2nd because um obviously on hogmanay and new year's eve in scotland we have the festivities <laughs> and then i wasn't really in a condition to write many words on january the 1st <laughs> we know what that means and i I needed the average. I needed the average of like 10,000. So by January the 2nd, I was behind. I think I was at maybe like 55,000 words and I had like six and a half days left to get to. I was aiming for 120. I got to 113, but I ended up working it up because the way the Not Alone books work is there's a lot of points of view and stuff. So you have chapters like that interweave with each other. So I just added another plot line that was going to hold back for the next book and just like kind of worked that in. But I got to 113, which was fine. You know, that was perfectly workable. Then I had another three weeks to work it up to the final target. But that was, I did actually feel like I wasn't going to make it then. But then I thought, I'm still going to have to get as close as I possibly can. So I just had to try and shake away the doubt and thought, even if I don't make it, I'll get close. Because the target was for January the 8th, because I was going away on January the 9th. And then I thought, worst comes to the worst. I'll just have to work on the plane. I'll have to work when I get there. I'll have to work on the plane back. But as it came, I didn't have to do that because working on a plane is not really ideal for me. It's not comfortable no. physically. No. 
can do it. But yeah, that's yeah, no, T-Rex arms when you're typing. I know. You, if my hands are sore writing ten thousand words on a real desk, I don't mm. even want to imagine what they're going to be like on an airplane scene. You know? <laughs> but yeah, um, that was the only time. But I think I just looked back and thought, other than yesterday and the day before, I did hit the target. I hit ten thousand words, and some of those days I was stopping at like eleven o'clock at night because I'd hit the target. So then I thought those days I just need to do that again and then just push through till three or four in the morning. Only a couple of times to catch up. And then that's what I did. That's how the 14,000 word days came about to make up for the half days on the 31st and the first. Mm. But yeah, I think that it would be much more difficult if you were brand new to writing and you didn't have perspective to fall back on. If I didn't know that I'd done 10,000 words in a day before, and we're talking about the quality of the words when they're fast. I think if you're starting out and you just try and write 10,000 words, they're not going to be as good as if you took your time a little bit yes. more. Yeah. But once you've got to the point where you're, you know, millions of words in, you can do it, you know? Yeah. How how do you construct your day? Because um, you obviously mentioned that you were finishing at sort of 11 o'clock and obviously on the days that you yeah. needed to increase that, you went further into the morning. Are you? Do you consider yourself a night writer? How, how does yeah. your day look in terms um, of sort of your times? Yeah. Very much so. I'm more productive at night. And I've I've kind of fought against that or tried to fight against that a few times. And I've tried to get up earlier and start writing early. So it could be done by like, on a normal day, this is not this crazy schedule. Mm-hmm. I would try and be done by like two in the afternoon. But it just doesn't work. I find it really difficult to work properly during daylight hours for some reason. And as soon as it gets dark, it's easier. I think it's just because I want to be doing things when it's daylight, you know, I feel like I'm missing out on stuff. Whereas at night, and obviously in Scotland, it gets dark at like two o'clock in the afternoon anyway, so (laughs) it it works for me. But yeah, um, I have consciously tried to fight against that, but then I think it was last year when I was writing Not Alone 3, I just came to realise you just have to recognise I am who I am, I'm going to work better at night. Mm -hmm. So for me, the best hours... The best hours are always between like seven and nine at night, like because that's when I'm not in the slightest bit tired, but I'm in the zone. It's night time. I can write in the afternoon, and for especially for the last book, I had to. But the words per hour weren't the same, and then at night it was just rocketing through them. And then I was getting up, maybe like at ten. Like I was getting up quite late because I was staying up so late. But then I was just trying to go easy on myself and not think like. It's not lazy to get up at 10 in the morning when I'm working till like 4 45 the night before, yeah. you know. Yeah, I think it's definitely very much yeah. on a night owl, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a sort of stigma around people that get up at certain times without consideration of how people construct their nights or what happens the night before. I think um, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because I find that my my entire writing schedule changed over the last month or so um because of my home situation. And because mm-hmm. of that, I'm now in a place where I can afford to get up later. But then We'll switch gear a little bit from um, timings and how we work our days because I want to jump into uh, one of the things I found interesting about you when I first met you is you you were one of the people that put out books on KDP and got a runaway hit on on some of your first books and uh, yeah. the fact that you've managed to keep that success of that first book that series running for so long and keep it profitable um, is there anything that you sort of actively been doing anything that you can attribute that success to in order to keep those books lively keep them breathing and keep them bringing in income well the first one um it was december 2015 not alone came out and it's difficult to talk about what i did now because the landscape is so different in terms of how you launch a book now versus then then i just i had modeled some other books like um Darren Wearmouth had a book that in sci-fi had done exactly what I wanted to do, which was come from nowhere and just break out at 99 cents and just sell. And in those days, all you could really do was lean on the promo sites that were available, you know, like the bargain books and stuff like that, because those are more effective. So I launched at 99 cents like he did, and I did that. But I think what helped Not Alone was I really engineered the presentation of the book from the ground up to try and make it a bestseller, which sounds like an obvious thing because we all want books to be bestsellers. But I'd had the Sycamore series before that that never really did anything for me. I mean, it did, I sold in the two years before that, it maybe sold like seven or 8,000 copies, which was fine, but it's not what I wanted. So I tried to just 
very consciously write a sci-fi book that could be a crossover hit that people who didn't read sci-fi would also read because I wanted, I really wanted it to break out like that because I felt like I could write something a little bit safer in a very firmly established genre, say military sci-fi or something like that. And I'm not saying I could just walk into that genre and sell, but there's an established audience there that if you take care, take your time, and if you do it well, you're going to get a certain number of sales. There's a floor, if you will. You're not going to drop below a certain number of sales if you do it well. But I felt like there was also a ceiling when you do something like that. When you go into a firmly entrenched genre, there's so many readers that read that, but you're not going to cross over. Whereas if I wrote something more general, like Not Alone, which is about an alien cover-up, it's not about you know, 100 years in the future, 100 light years away or anything like that. It's a very accessible story set in the real world. If I did that well, and if I presented it well, it could break out and it could cross over. If I sold enough copies in sci-fi to start with, to get into the Amazon algorithms and to get into the overall charts, then people who were interested in conspiracy thrillers would start picking it up. People mm -hmm. who just were interested in aliens but don't normally read sci-fi would pick it up. And I started to see that in the reviews, the, the early reviews, it was people saying I don't normally read sci-fi, which was a surprise to me because I didn't expect it to be quite so fast that that would work out. And then for the first month, the sales were just a straight line up. And I wasn't really doing that much other than the scheduled promo sites that I had. But what was happening was the book was converting very well. When people saw it, they bought it because there was... I think a very important point was congruence between the title, the cover, the blurb. You know, it's called Not Alone. You know what it's about. The cover looks like a movie poster. It's got a giant UFO on it, flying saucer, and it says Not Alone. So you know what it's about. And then the blurb, when I was engineering the story, this was in 2015, but I'd been writing it for a few years when we had all the stories about, you know, Julian Assange, Edward Snowden. All the leaks were a big thing then. So I made the story about that. It's about an alien cover-up, but the protagonist is a guy who leaks the evidence. And then you read the blurb, you know that this guy's life is going to change. It's going to get difficult. But people wanted to read a story like that, where there's a good guy trying to get the truth out. So I think all these things kind of came together. And then it just hit the critical mass at the time, which was probably easier then because there were less people launching books at 99 cents. Less people were serious about authorship and publishing. There wasn't the same industry that there is now in terms of service providers providing quality covers, marketing advice and stuff like that. So it was far less crowded. But even then, it did still stand out above the other people who were trying to do it then. And since then, it, I think it just simply sold enough at the time that it got into the algorithms to sustain itself. I kept promoting it. And then when Amazon advertising came along, AMS, I heavily dived into that. And then I dived into Facebook advertising a year later. So I was hitting all these audiences. I started hitting a new Facebook audience when the sequel came out, Not Alone 2. And that was an untapped market for me at the time. And then Not Alone 3, I got a, started in book bub ads and stuff like that. So I was hitting new audiences where I could all the time. But I think it was the engineering. I took my time to find a niche, if you will, but not in terms of a subgenre where there was already a great example of books. I looked at a, a subject more than a genre, and the subject was aliens, basically, in a contemporary setting. And there weren't many books about that. And the reason I thought it could work so well with a breakout hit was there's a lot of movies like that. If you think of the big alien films that people think of, it's E.T., The Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Super 8, Signs, films like that that are about aliens in the current world. And another thing about those films was they all have a lot of heart. There's a lot of sentimentality in those films. They don't shy away from that. So what Not Alone has is that in spades. It's a small town setting. Everyone's on the same team. They're nice to each other. But it's all in the midst of this grand conspiracy with these evil forces fighting against this good guy. But there's a lot of heart. And I think sometimes modern sci-fi kind of shies away from sentimentality, particularly in the military stuff that's aiming for the KU crowd, often by necessity because books are so tight these days, they're so tightly paced and everything. But I think it was it was a little refresher for people who wanted something different. And obviously, we both know it's a very long book, so it's 223,000 words, which is essentially a box set, really. It could have been a trilogy <laughs> easily. 
but I sold it for 99 cents. So people get to the end and they think, uh, wow, that was like three times as long as the other books I've read recently. So it's that's an instant positive feeling in their mind. And then that helps with the word of mouth, which really helps hmm. when people, if you give people more <laughs> than they expect, that's when they recommend it to their friends. And that's when it really kicks on. So it was all these things. It was the, trying to engineer the the presentation to be as optimal as possible. But before that, I chose what the book was going to be about based on what I thought could be this kind of breakout success, which is what I was going for. And the people I was modeling then, was talking about modeling specific success, it was guys like A.G. Riddle with the Atlantis gene. And he's talked about what he calls curb appeal, which is hooking your book onto something that people are already interested in, which for him was the word Atlantis. You know, that brings people in instantly. For me, it was not alone because that's a phrase we all know. We are not alone make the cover nice and obvious that's a curb appeal people are walking past that book or if it was in a bookshop they would see it oh not alone big ufo they know what it is mm. it's a pre-sold idea and you're in and then it came to making sure the book was good enough which is a we don't need to talk about that because everyone <laughs> watching this knows about writing books and stuff obviously yeah. but yeah it was the presentation and then it was the subject were the two things for me mm. How, because uh, you seem very, very methodical in your research. Obviously, you you put a lot of I thought was, yeah. into how you you plan your book. The kind of even from before the book's written, you're already looking ahead to kind mm-hmm. of where that can and fit can fit in. What tips would you give to people who are perhaps looking at starting to write a book? They know what genre they're going to go in, but they might not necessarily know how to find the specific examples that translate best to them and the stuff that they write. In terms of finding other Kindle books that that have done it. So if yeah. someone's writing, yeah, uh, well, well, the obvious place to look is the charts, but there's so much churn on Amazon now compared to then. You know, the top 100 sci-fi, if you take a snapshot today and take a snapshot in two weeks, there's probably going to be 20 books that are still there. Whereas in 2015, if you did that, you'd have 80 books still there. There was nowhere near the same level of churn. So it can be difficult to find the successes if they're not immediately apparent. And there's really no shortcut other than looking through the genre lists on Amazon until you find something that looks applicable. And then another thing, once you find it, I know the question was, how do you find it? But there's really no shortcut to that, to find the comps, the books that are comparable to what you're writing. You just really have to look. You have to keep digging. But once you find them, another specific thing I did very consciously was I spent a lot of time reading reviews of other books positive and negative but especially the positive reviews to look for the common things that people liked what they were specifically mentioning because you get the reviews it's a great book which is great it tells you someone liked the book but i was interested in the substantive reviews you know the reviews that are multiple paragraphs and when you start seeing things that people like repeatedly over and over again and sometimes it was in some of the books it was about the the relationships between the characters, they would say things like the characters felt more real than they normally do in sci-fi or the relationships with the characters really developed over the course of the story or the book was nice and long. I've seen stuff like that. So I took all that into account and then thought, if I want to have these successes, I have to do these things. But in terms of finding the books, you really, you just have to dig. And then also once you dig, you want to be sure that you're modeling the right thing. You need to know that it's had enough success to be worth modeling if you know what i mean like you don't want to model a book that hasn't succeeded because then with the best will in the world if you do the same things you're probably not going to succeed either so you want to look at things like review account because as i said the rank especially if you're looking at a book that's years old the rank's going to be way down so you want to look at things like review account you want to look at review average see how the author's done since then because sometimes Like, not alone for me, that's done way better than Teradox or Sycamore or anything. So if someone was modeling me, I would say to them, look at not alone, because that's the one that's done best. So you want to see what was different about that. And I did that. I looked at authors who had done well with one book and maybe not so well with the others. And I thought, well, what is the difference between these books? And sometimes that's quite apparent. And then you can say, well, I'll do more of what they did with this book and less of what they did with this book. And oftentimes that's mainly the presentation. You don't need to read the books. Obviously, for the most comparable books you want to read them just to know the context and what readers liked when you're reading the reviews you want to know yourself what the readers are talking about so you read those books but you don't need to read every book you just need to look at it and say if i was a reader 
how would I react to this? The blurb, the title, the categorization, all these small things. But yeah, in terms of finding the books, just dig. And I can promise it won't be wasted time, even if it takes you days to find the most applicable, successful books. It will be time very well spent. How long do you spend on researching when it comes to looking at your next project? Uh, well, not alone. Um, I had that idea in January 2013, and I didn't start writing it until May 2015. And I was, I, I wouldn't say I wasn't doing anything else in that time, but I wasn't doing much else in that time. Because that the book, there will be some people listening who have read it, and it's just, it is so complicated. You know, and I don't, I don't say that in a, either a braggadocious sense or like a sense that I wish it wasn't so complicated. It's just such a complicated book. There's so many conspiracies and meta conspiracies woven into it and so much history and fake history, alternative history. It took me so long, especially when I was weaving in the leaks and all that stuff. And I didn't start writing the book until very late, until about six months before it came out. So for a year and a half, I was just researching. And I was researching everything in sci-fi. I was researching average chapter lengths of books that done well and stuff like that. Like I would have to buy the books and then just work that out myself, look at the work count, look at how many chapters there were. And it became apparent to me at that point that there was a sweet spot around 1400 words, which since then, since then I've developed a far better understanding of story structure and things like that because I've read the books on it, which I hadn't read back then. But that's a natural length for a scene, like the 1200 to 1500 word range is the length of a scene. And in movies, it equates to the same kind of thing. But I didn't know that. I didn't know why that was the case. I just knew from looking at these sci-fi books and in a sense, reverse engineering success and then rebuilding it from the ground up. I knew that that was a good sweet spot for chapter length. So I went with that. I made it so that my book would have chapters roughly that length. All specific things like that. You can get as deep as you want. You don't have to get that deep. But I was just looking for optimization wherever I could find it because that was my big swing for the fences book. I was spending so much time on that. It really had to had to succeed or I would have had to think about something else if it hadn't succeeded. So I put everything I could into it. And since then, I haven't really done a big new thing because my Stickmore series was already out before Not Alone and that's wrapped up. And then between Not Alone 1 and Not Alone 2, I wrote two books in the Teradox series, which was kind of a palate cleanser for me. They're far more straightforward space exploration kind of stories because, to be honest, I was intimidated to write the sequel to Not Alone because I didn't know how I could follow it up. And because the first book was supposed to be the end, like it had an end and it was never supposed to have a sequel. So I had to think, how can I continue this without it feeling like I'm just cashing in? So I was intimidated, so I had to write something else just to kind of prove to myself that it wasn't a one hit wonder kind of thing. And then Teradox required far less research because it was just a kind of straight space exploration series where I can make up the science and all that stuff. <laughs> it was set on a made up world. I can make up the rules. Yeah. But, but for my next thing, I'm not going to take a year to research it, but what I'm going to do is write, I've got at least one more not alone book to come not alone six and then i think we're going to write another series that will be a little bit faster more like paradox but in the meantime i'll be researching the next big thing and that'll take me probably the better part of six months about a third of my time probably so if we equate that to full time it would be like two months of work researching where i'm going next maybe a month researching where i'm going next and then a month digging further down into researching precisely where i'm going next if you know what i mean yeah. Like I'll pick a subject, analyze it, and then I'll start looking for comps. I'll start looking for films that have done well, see what people like about that. Because it's all about emotional resonance at the end of the day. People read these books for a reason. They want something. They want the good guy to win. So you, for for one part of the story, you have to make it look like the good guy's not going to win, right? That's, that's the key thing. And that was something that I tried really hard because, as I said, I didn't know much about story structure in the formal sense. I hadn't read the books, but I knew that just from so many books that I've read, so many films that I've seen, there has to be a point where it looks like the character's in a hopeless situation. So what I did was focus from the outset, how am I going to get this character called Dan, incidentally? Hey. How am I going to get Dan in the worst <laughs> possible spot? And then once Dan is in this spot, how do I make it worse? And how do I... Because, you know, you get your character in a hole, is what people say, but you have to get your character in a hole and then you have to start filling that hole with lava and you have to have 
no way of them getting out of that hole. So the reader really thinks it's done. And I've had comments, two people have told me that they literally threw their Kindle at a wall when it reached the <laughs> point where, where the lava starts falling into Dan's hole. So it looks like he can't escape. But, you know, there's a fine line between love and hate, between anger and happiness. When you get people feeling something strongly, then you flip it back around. You know, they're elated when the character mm. then wins. And then they've got this feeling of, wow, that was a roller coaster, which is what you want. But one thing that's worth saying as well, I've mentioned a few times I, I hadn't read the story structure books and all things like that. Between Not Alone 1 and Not Alone 2, I went through a couple of months where it was almost paralysis through analysis because I was reading too many of those books. Yes. I was thinking, I, I need to set it up, I need to hit the beats like this. And then eventually there came a point where I just kind of threw it all out and thought, I wasn't worrying about this last time and it worked mm. because I was just going by my instinct of what worked. And it's always good to read these things or well, sometimes good to read these things to get the insight and get the general perspective, but you never want to become, I wouldn't say dependent, but you never want to become paralyzed by them, which is what was happening to me. Cause I was thinking, okay, this has to happen at 17% and all that stuff, <laughs> which isn't the way it's not the way to do it, you know? Yeah, it's I think really there not. is a there is a, a point you reach of diminishing returns in which you absolutely just keep studying, studying. And I've I've been in exactly the same situation. I think once you've had a couple of books out, you you go down that rabbit hole of okay, well, how can I make these better? And you you refer to all these these books, these people who are offering you advice that has been tried and tested throughout the years. And I think, like you say, there you get to a point where if you've watched enough stories, if you've read enough stories, if you've written enough stories, there's enough of a structure within you that as you're writing, you do get to uh, know, understand yeah. the ebbs and flows and you can overthink it quite quite easily. Um, one one uh, thing that I did want to touch on, because um, I say this every interview, but time is absolutely flying, uh, is obviously you write long, uh, your first yep. um, book in the Not Alone series, 220,000 words. Do you feel any pressure given the current state of uh, particularly independent publishing in the, um, I guess, the push that people have on the rapid release model on the writing fast does that in any way sort of impacted how uh, you see your releases because you seem to have taken quite a steady approach to writing each book you obviously take your time make sure you're happy with it you you take the weeks and months however long it needs to finish mm -hmm. has any of that push come your way has any of that made it inside of you because you've gone to a few conferences as well where that has been yeah. a lesson that is encouraged not sort of hit on the head but is encouraged as, as a way to increase success. yeah success. it's a good point the books have gotten shorter they've gotten progressively shorter um i mean the last one came in one hundred and thirty thousand in the end after i applied everything so it's still a long book but it came down from 223 i think then 185 120 125 130 so my range now is around 130 and i haven't felt a pressure to start writing faster because they've been doing well enough. I haven't had the income pressure or anything like that. But from Edinburgh, we talked about the box sets and this it was kind of a positive pressure that I had, more of a peer pressure that you should be working harder kind of thing. Yeah. So I had that and it came in terms of accelerating my workload with the box set on the marketing side and the publication side, but also with the production side. And then I think I mentioned earlier I committed to writing three not alone books and the time it would have previously taken me to write one. And I because this was for the audio deal and I told Audible they'll all be at least 125,000 words because I feel like that's the shortest that these books can be when readers expect a certain length. So I haven't compromised on the length because not only three was 120,000 words and then four, five and six are all going to be at least 125. So I didn't compromise on the length. I just started working a lot harder so that I could get into this something more akin to a rapid release schedule. It's still not rapid, you know, not alone four was December, not alone five is going to be February, and not alone six is going to be May. But that's still three books in five months or whatever, whereas mm. before, the fastest I was getting for not alone was a year between two and three, and there had been two and a half years between one and two. So I just wanted to see, really, I wanted to see if the pace would make any difference, because obviously rapid release works very well for some people, hugely. But when they're talking rapid, they're talking, you know, 18 days at most. A yeah. week, sometimes two weeks between <laughs> books. I just wanted to try and squeeze that schedule so I don't have the blank spaces that I used to have of months on end without a release. So there wasn't the, the pressure. It was, as I said, it was the positive pressure. And that came directly from the conferences and stuff like you mentioned, when everyone else is having success writing through the rapid release system. I thought, 
I'll I'll try and give it a go, you know. But mainly it was because I wanted the audio advance and I had a better chance of getting a good advance with three books at once rather than one. And I wanted that. I wanted to make hay when the sun was shining, you know. Yeah, let's tap quickly into that because I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to lose the opportunity just to um, get into that as well. You the so this audio deal. Tell us a little bit about it, how it came about, and, and what you're trying to do. Well, it started out with um, not alone one. I think the first audio deal I got was February 2016, which was two months after Not Alone came out, and the book had been doing really well. It was you know obnoxiously visible at that point. It had been top of the, all the sci-fi charts for two months at that point and I got in touch with an agent through another guy and this is one of those cases where in the independent world we kind of shy away from agents and stuff like that but in some contexts they can do things that you can't do for yourself like some of the deals I've had since then and the first deal was a for me it was three thousand dollars the first one and I thought wow that's a lot of money you know I thought that was all I was ever going to see from it and I thought wow because the work was done this was just bonus money Hmm. A three thousand dollar advance, <laughs> which was nothing compared to what I was making an ebook at the time. But I thought, wow, I'll, I'll take that. And then uh, the ebook, the audiobook, sorry, when it came out, it just absolutely exploded, and it was almost inexplicable how it done so well. Because the narrator is great, the narrator is brilliant, but for all intents and purposes, he was a no-name narrator. He wasn't like an R.C. Ray or anyone who's got a following. People wouldn't recognize the name, especially back then. But I think, again, it comes back to the length, and especially in audio, the length is a huge value proposition because of the way Audible works. People pay their monthly fee, they get one book. And if they can get a book that's going to last nine hours and they can get a book that's going to last 22 hours, which book are they going to get? All things being equal, they go for the long one because, as I said, it was essentially a box set by accident. I basically wrote a box set length book. So it just flew. And then not only two came, when that was coming, I mentioned to the agent, I've got a sequel coming. And they gave us an offer on that. Good, what seemed like a good five-figure offer at the time, but it wasn't enough. And he went back to them, came back the next day, the next day with an offer that was two and a half times higher than the first. And if I had went to Audible and said, give me two and a half times as much, they would have just laughed me out mm. of the proverbial room. The email would have just come back. No, <laughs> <laughs> take it. You'll take it and you'll like it kind of thing. <laughs> So then Not Alone 3 came and we got the same as we got for Not Alone 2. And then I thought, maybe if I go to them with a proposition for a second trilogy, rather than do it one book at a time, you know, four, five, six, maybe if I go for a, a trilogy, not only will I get the guarantee up front, that, because it's nice to have that guarantee, you, you've made at least this much money for these books. But maybe I'll, because I'm giving them three, I'll get more per book than I was getting before and that's how it worked out the advance it was not only triple an individual book the pair book was higher than I've gotten in the past so that was great I mean that fantastic I didn't feel like I had weight on me before but that takes so much weight off when you're writing a book that's so long and you know that you're guaranteed it's already made mm. a consider, considerable amount of money but yeah that the agent there I would I would say to people when you reach a certain point Agents can work for you very well, especially if it's a good agent. If it, if he comes recommended, or she comes recommended, go for it. Where did that um, idea come from for you, though? Because I don't think that's something the, that would have automatically come into my mind. Of what's that? The the trilogy yeah, idea, like the, yeah, 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 that that initial um, approach to I'm going to go up to them and say, "What if I give you three books?" Where did that idea come from? Well, it was in the back of my mind that I wanted to write three books quite quickly, anyway after Edinburgh, and it all comes back to Edinburgh, this more rapid production schedule, that I was going to try and write three books within six months rather than one book within six months. So I thought rather than go to them and say, I've got book four coming, because the thing is, things move pretty slowly at Audible. I know that the offers come quickly, but by the time you get the contracts through and everything, and then you have to double check everything. And I thought, I don't really want to do this three times in the next couple of months. I don't want to go to them with book four then go to them with book five, then go to them with book six. So I just said, do you think it would be worth pitching a trilogy this time? And he said, yeah, we'll see what they say. And it came back. It was really, um, it was probably 50% that, that I didn't want unnecessary headaches of three negotiations when I could have one. Maybe 30% that I thought, I'll get more money if I do this. If I give them mm -hmm. three at once, it's worth more because they know they're going to get three books out of it. And then, 
it was probably 20 percent i really wanted a nice chunk of money at once like i've, I've always had I always had in my head <laughs> i wanted a six-figure advance that was like a I used to, like I've got a little vision board that I've always had, and one of the things on it was always I wanted to make at least a hundred thousand dollars with a single signature, you know, like mm. a six figure advance. And I always thought that would be a comprehensive deal that would include text, obviously text rights and everything. But you know, to get it for audio only was huge for me because then the books are going to make money in KU, the sales revenue when I'm releasing them at full price. So what I felt like in Edinburgh is I was going to come at it with a triangular approach that was going to keep making money with the sales revenue on these books as they come out. That was the first pillar. Triangles don't have pillars, but we'll just pretend <laughs> that metaphor works. If you look at them, and then they might have. Yeah, maybe. Pyramids, <laughs> they don't have pillars either. But anyway, the second triangular pillar was going to be the audio. I wanted to make more audio money than I was making already. And then the third one was the mass KU revenue from the box sets. And that's how the last six months have worked out the last four months have worked out because as i said at the start january has been my best month ever for ebook revenue beating de december 2019 which is my best month ever and that's excluding the audio revenue that i'm getting from these books i'm writing right now so all considered these are my best months you know by a factor of two at least Fantastic. and it's all down all down to edinburgh you know there you go and it's, it really is. I, I love the irony as well that Edinburgh. You, do you live in Edinburgh or not far from Edinburgh? No, I live. I live about like nine miles south of Edinburgh. So it all changed Edinburgh. nine miles from your house. It all did. <laughs> yeah, well, it really started. It started in London. You know, that was the yeah. best decision. Literally, the best decision I ever made was to go to mm. London, and then from there I went to Vegas, and then from there I went to Edinburgh. I've met so many great people. You know, like great friends, business relationships, all kinds of relationships everything i've learned but like you said it's like there's something contagious about the spirit that you get there it really is because it is a solitary pursuit and the facebook groups and everything are great but there's just nothing like being in a room full of people that are on the same journey you know mm, absolutely i uh, yeah, yeah I, I think that's a good place to to round it up because we are running near time yeah. um, i do have some questions for you from some of my patrons over at patreon.com forward slash great writers share um if you're happy to answer those i have one from yeah Jen Mitchell, who asks, what kinds of things did you do to deal with the pressure of trying to write the next few books following such a huge initial success? It's a good question from Jen. Mustang Sally. <laughs> um, well, as I, I touched on it, really, I, I felt like I had to write something in between, between Not Alone 1 and Not Alone 2, because I was feeling the pressure of how do I follow this up. So basically, I wrote two other books to kind of convince myself that it wasn't a, a one-hit wonder kind of thing that I could write something else that would succeed. And also that just gave me time by writing these other books. I was doing something I was, I wasn't, you know, the devil makes work for idle hands, right? But also if your mind's empty, you start doubting yourself even more if your time's empty. So I was writing these other two books and then at night, sometimes at the weekend, I'd sit down and think, okay, I'll spend a few hours just thinking with no pressure about not alone to. And then, I was just writing ideas as they came to my head, very general notes with no pressures if they would make sense within a plot or anything like that. And then by the time I'd finished these two Teradox books, I just looked at that notes document and it was probably about 15,000 words long. And I just started going through it, taking bits out, thinking there's, there's actually some good stuff here. Because was, I was just like throwing stuff at the wall. What could happen? Scene ideas, character ideas, the ways relationships could change and stuff like that. So... I was giving myself time, really. I, I didn't force it. I didn't think, okay, I have to write the sequel immediately. Obviously, I gave myself way too much time because it was two and a half years, which if anyone wants an optimal time, we talk about rapid releases at 18 <laughs> days, is it 14 days? It's not two and a half years, I can tell you that. <laughs> so just don't, don't model that part if you're modeling yeah. that one. Just pretend that that part didn't exist. Mm. Fantastic. We got a question from Mark McClure who asks, do you plot, pant, or dance between the two? Well, especially for the previous books, for Not Alone 1 and 2 and 3, I plotted extensively, very, very extensively. And I feel like for a book of the nature of Not Alone, I had to do that because otherwise I would have just tripped myself up all over the place because there's so much conspiracy going on, what's true, <laughs> what's not, who knows what, when, and all that stuff. But now, for the last, for the last two that I've just written, 4 and 5, I had the outline, but it was an outline. 
whereas for the first three, I basically had I had the skeleton of the book written. Sometimes I'd have a note for not alone. I had notes that were like sixty thousand words or something, which is pretty much a book. Like that's the length of a book, and I knew what was happening the whole way through. Which for the last few, I just had the bones, you know, and this is the structure of the book. This is where it starts. This is where it ends. This is broadly the path of how I get from the start to the end. But by then, I knew the characters. I knew the world. I trusted myself more that I would get there and it would make sense. So I wouldn't say I pants the last one, but it was far less plotting than I used to do. So for the last one, I feel like I was dancing. I thought the marks were dancing in between. I felt like I was dancing in between the two for the last one, for sure. Do you feel like that's Again, the approach you'll take going forward? Yeah. I, well, when I write something completely new, I think I'll, I'll plot it again extensively just to get to grips with the world and characters and all that stuff. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, now we are going to fire into our quick fire round. So I know this Here is the one that you've been waiting for, the stuff you've been Oh, I've been looking for. forward to this one for months, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've got 10 questions. I'm going to throw at you as quickly as possible. Try and answer sure. as quickly as you can. Obviously, you can pass at any point. Are you ready? Okay. Fast. Okay. <laughs> Skittles <laughs> or M&Ms? Oh, Skittles. How many novels have you written? Gosh, I think about 11, 10, 11. Surf or turf? Yeah. Neither. What's the most number of stars you've seen at once? 200. <laughs> What's your favourite planet? Earth. It's the only one <laughs> I've visited so far. <laughs> Do aliens exist? Absolutely. God. What are you currently reading? Nothing, to be honest, nothing. What's one place you would never want to visit? Um, one place I'd never want to visit? Ooh. I might have to pass until I think of something. Um, pass. pass? Yep. What's your favourite clothing brand? Oh, um, Ralph Lauren. What's your favourite way to let off steam? Football playing football nice fantastic Ten questions. Ball as hard as i can yeah so what, what, was, what did i pass on i passed on one place you would want never to want to visit venus hmm. too hard yeah. yeah good choice yeah. nice so that's 10 questions uh one bonus one for you where can our listeners find out more about yourself and everything that you're working on um facebook's probably the best place i think it's just facebook.com forward slash craig a falconer um, I don't really use my website, so I would just direct you to Facebook or just search for my name on Facebook and you'll find me there. Mm. And then I've got a page, I've got a fan group you can join. The fan group's far more active, so you can just join us there. Fantastic. So thank you very much, okay. Craig, for coming on the show. It's been an absolute blast talking about you. Um, thank and you, Dan. If you've got anything you want to plug, any of your books, then now's your last chance. Yeah, not really. Um, if you've not read Not Alone, just get the box set while it's 99 cents. You get the first three books, 550,000 words for 99 cents. You can't beat that. Excellent. Check it well, out. Th <laughs> well, thank you again for coming on and thanks everyone for listening and I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Great Writer Share podcast. Next week, I'll be joined by USA Today bestselling author of fantasy and cover designer Meg Cowley. You can get more involved in the show by jumping over to our brand new Facebook group. There you can meet like-minded writers, ask guests questions, and get involved in monthly giveaways. Just head on over to www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash great writers share or search great writers share in the search box and just dive right in. Until next time.